conviction, say, lead me. Lead me. All right. And so, and if you don't know what that is, it is a picture of a sheep. And so, we're doing this series based on Psalm 23, and we're taking a journey of uh, the next few weeks. But as I started today, you know, some of you might not know, but I, I'm a comedian. Did anybody know that? Like, uh, I do comedy on the side. I'm just kidding. I know. But I was trying to find some jokes, some sheep jokes that hopefully you will enjoy as much as I did as I was preparing my sermon. So what do you call a sheep with no legs? A cloud. Uh, Alright, what about this one? What do you call a sheep that's covered in chocolate? A candy? Uh, uh, two more. Why was this sheep arrested on the freeway? Because it did an illegal U-turn. What do you call a sheep with a machine gun? A uh, bad situation. <laughs> and so, I love it. Um, so Psalm 23 is a reference to the, to, to the Lord being our great shepherd. And so this is written by King David, and this is the same King David who killed who's in the story of David and Goliath. So when he became king, he began to write these songs. And, and coming from a background as a shepherd, to him this spoke directly as he was referring to God because he knew what it was like to be a good shepherd. He wasn't just, just any old shepherd because when you read some of his stories, he protected his sheep. There's stories where he kind of ripped lines apart and killed bears. Like This guy knew what it was like to be a good shepherd. And so he was writing this because he wanted, he was kind of saying to the Lord, he was like, Lord, this is what it looks like when we're part of your family that you take care of us. So this is where it came from. And, and I don't know if you knew this, but this is very interesting. It comes from this book. And it, it's, a, it's a rancher who took care of sheep. And so this is what he says about sheep. He says that sheep require more attention than any other livestock. They just can't take care of themselves. And unless sheep Unless the shepherd makes a move on, sheep will actually ruin a pasture eating every blade of grass until finally a fertile pasture is nothing but barren soil. He says sheep are nearsighted and very stubborn, but easily frightened. An entire flock can be stampeded by a single jackrabbit. They have little means of defense. They're timid, feeble creatures. Their only recourse is to run if no shepherd is there to protect them. Sheep have no homing instincts. A dog, a horse, a cat, or a bird can find its way home, but when a sheep gets lost, it's a goner unless someone rescues them. And so as we're thinking about this reference to sheep, you know, the Bible talks about how, how people were so much like sheep, and when I read this, I think about us because I think sometimes we try to do a good job at taking care of ourselves, but I, would, I really do believe that unless God is the one who's leading us and taking care of us, you can't do as good of a job as our good shepherd God can do. And I think this year is so appropriate that if we want to have a great year in, in, in how we spend our finances, in how we use our resources, in how we, we use our spiritual gifts, gifts, big decisions that we need to make, the only way that we're going to see the most success out of this year is if we allow the Lord to lead us. Can you say lead me? Lead me one more time. And so I believe with all my heart that as individuals, that if we allow the Lord to lead us, then what happens corporately as a church, where this church of disobedience, and then eventually what's going to happen is we're going to have a greater impact. Why? Because I believe as we're led by the Lord, He's going to direct us to do great and mighty and awesome things for Him throughout the year. And I don't know about you, but this is the kind of life, this is the kind of life that I want to have. I want to have a life this year that, that's just so full of purpose. You know, I want to know that the decisions that I make this year aren't just because I thought it was a good idea, but this is a God-directed, God-led, Holy Spirit-anointed decision in my life. And, and, and even when it comes to the small things to the big things, I say, Lord, I want you to lead us. So let's read this together. Psalm 23. Just I want you to repeat it or say it together. We'll just start in verse 1. Ready to go? One, two, go. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they come for me. You prepare a table before me. 
presence of my enemies. Your doings, my head in oil, my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. And see, not only I believe that when God leads us, He's going to help us make have this amazing year, but I want this one to look at today. Is there's so many benefits of being led by God. Like when we belong to God, we're, and when we commit our lives to Jesus, and, and when we become one of those sheep in his pen, not only does he help us live this great, awesome, nurturing, provision, life full of provision kind of life, but also there's so many benefits that I don't believe happen unless you belong to him. And that's what I want to talk about today. We're going to look at a few verses, and I pray in my heart is that you would see the benefits of what happens when God is your good shepherd. And if you don't know Jesus here today, that you would ask yourself really hard questions even before, you, before we finish tonight. That, wow, why, why isn't the life, this is the life that I want to have? And that you would commit to a relationship. Or if you do know Jesus, by the end of tonight's service, that you would understand more and more how much God cares about you. And not only is he there to help and to protect you, but to provide for you, but there's so much blessing and benefits when we belong to him. So here's the first thing that I believe that we're going to look at today is, is that when we belong to Jesus, when we are part of his flock, that he rests me. He rests me. Who got a lot of sleep over the last few weeks? Anybody enjoy this? It's some really good sleep. A few people. Oh man, I, I love to get some rest. And before Julie, Lila was born, before Julie was born, before Lila was born, probably almost every day I would take like an hour and a half nap, you know, because uh, I just love, I just love to be rested. And I remember when we found out Julie was pregnant, I thought to myself, oh my gosh, what am I going to do without my afternoon nap? Well, you know, you find energy sometimes, do, but you know, you just like to be rested. When I became a, a, a youth volunteer, so I was working a full-time job at McDonald's, I was working a full-time volunteer job as a youth pastor of about 65 students, and I just started meeting Julie, and I remember I would, I would wake up at 6, go finish off at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and, and just kind of run with the church, but Fridays was such a hard day for us, because I would get up at 6 a.m., finish around 12, knowing that I had to get to the church around 4 o'clock to preach a sermon, play kickball, just have fun with like 65 and sometimes 100 students, just as a volunteer. I remember just some weeks, a few months into it, just thinking, God, I just can't go on. I am so tired right now. And I would just kind of lay down and I would turn some music on. It. And I just felt like God was speaking. He said, Dave, just, just take some time. Just rest right now. And then I would just put some music on. And I would just kind of take like a 25 minute, 30 minute nap. And man, I would wake up just ready to go. And, and, and there's something so special about having this rest. But here's an interesting fact about sheep. For Psalms 23, 2 says this. It says, he lets me rest in green meadows. He lets me rest in green meadows. And here's the fact about sheep. That unless sheep are free, are free from all fear, uh, they will not rest. So if there's tension between other members within the flock, if they're aggravated because of parasites and bugs, or if they are hungry, sheep will never rest. So think about the life of a person. And you don't have to raise your hand, but how many of you right now, there's just tension between in relationships in your life? Think about it as you go through the line about your brothers and your sisters, your parents, people in your life. Maybe you just feel like this overwhelming sense of just unsettledness. And you try to get rest, and maybe there's times you push it to the side, but yet relationships seem to just be causing you this type of stress. And you know what? Unless you allow God to repair, to restore, and bring peace to those relationships, You'll never be able to fully enter into the rest that God has for you. So what are your relationships looking at today? As a young person, maybe 16 to 18 years old, I remember just being in and out of some relationships with girls, and it was just this turmoil. It was just a mess. And I thank God that my family were pretty close. We would fight once in a while, not always, maybe because I don't see them. 3,000 miles away, but, but we call each other on a regular basis. My, my brother FaceTimes me to talk with his kids, and I say, God, thank you that when I think about our relationship with my family, like I've got a good family base. But I understand that there's a lot of people in this room that don't. So when you look at it and think about your family members, like, you just get angry inside. And you know what? You'll never be 
be able to fully receive the rest of the time. Let's just say, Lord, I need you to help me prepare the peace of those relationships. And this is also important to relationships between people in the church. You know, I love the fact that Bridge Family Church, we, I think for the most part, we get along. I think we all love each other. You know, maybe we don't always like each other, or maybe somebody bothers you or does something that annoys you. But you know what? I think when we come into this place, but that's normal. You know, I think about it. If you have a family, there's going to be the, 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 the great uncle that you love, and then there's going to be the, the, the aunt who's 80 years old who's breath stinks, and you still have to love her. You know, you might not want to sit on her lap and have a conversation, but she's still part of your family. But this is what Bridge Family Church is like right now. But what's going to happen when we start to get some really oddballs that come out of the church? You know, I, I think we have a few oddballs in this place already, but that's cool. Hey, I think I'm an oddball, you know. Are, are we still going to have the sense of love for everybody? You know, what happens when you begin to fight with other people? How, is, how are we going to handle conflict? Because if the people on the outside think that they're looking and they say, hey, I want to be a part of this family of, of believers. I want to become a Christian, but yet there's so much tension in the flock. We'll never be at rest, and we'll never fully be able to have an impact and an influence in our community. So one thing we need to guard, and one thing we need to protect, is unity and love. And God would help us to just get rid of all this tension within our family. I don't think it's there now, but let's pray against it that it never comes our way. What about aggravation from like It says that she can't get rest unless they are free, free from all aggravations of like bugs and parasites. So can I ask you, in your life today, what's bugging you? Are there things that are just literally bugging you? And, and, and is it time for you just, again, one more time, to say, God, I need you to get rid of this because this situation is bugging me. And I don't know what to do, and I'm so frustrated, and every time I think about it, I can go into distress, and bite my nails, and I grab my teeth at night. And it's this time God saying, listen, just lay these situations down at my feet, I'm going to take care of you. And the last thing is, it's hunger. If sheep are hungry, then they will never fully find this. You know, in that passage of the, in the scripture, when it talks about this, this hunger, I think the only way we can really ever be full is when we take in all that God has for us. The Bible refers to, to the Lord as like the bread of life. You know, and, and unless we're satisfied by God and Him fully, you know, we're going to try to feed ourselves and be full of other things. But you know what? That hunger is eventually going to go away and we're going to get hungry again. But God says, listen, only turn to me because I'm the true source of, 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 of food for you. And then I love this in Matthew 11, 28 to 30. This is what it says. It says, are you tired? Are you worn out? Are you burned out on religion? Jesus says, come to me. Get away with me and you'll Cover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't let anything heavy or ill fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live free and lightly. See, the Bible talks about when we are a part of God's family and we, when we find true satisfaction in our the tension within relationships, the things that bug us in life, this hunger that can only be satisfied in Him, what happens is we find this true rest that Jesus Christ wants us to have. The Bible says this in Psalms 4 8. It says, I will both I will both lie down in peace and sleep. Um, so this is baby talk. He says, I will both lie down in peace and sleep for you alone, Lord. They be well in safety. See, there's something special about knowing that this good shepherd is watching our back. Because you can go to bed at night knowing that you're going to be taken care of. So the next thing is what happens? What are the benefits of, of being a part of God's family, being a part of his flock? Is that Psalms 23, 2, finishing off that verse, says this. Is he leads me besides peaceful stream. I don't know if that's a very peaceful stream, but it looks pretty exciting for this little kid. So he leads me besides peaceful stream. Uh, streams. Sheep cannot survive without water. Right? Think about it. As humans, uh, we cannot survive without our water. But they rely on the shepherd to take them to the best places, to the greenest pastures that have the best to it. And sheep, if it's a nice, cool morning, they'll wake up just before the sun rises. Because if you 
ever driven around Scala, what happens is the sun is rising. There's this beautiful dew that's all over the grass, and sheep love to just eat on that dew because it satisfies their thirst. And the Bible says that God will lead us to these peaceful streams. But this is what happens with sheep, and I think so many people are like this. That if there's no good shepherd to lead them, what's going to happen is, is they will find any place that will satisfy their thirst. They will go to any polluted ditch, they will go to any polluted river that might have parasites or diseases. They don't care what it looks like, they will drink from it, thinking that they're doing their bodies good. But in fact, when they drink from this polluted river or stream or just ditching it in the ground, they eventually make themselves sick. But think about people in this world, and maybe even you're here today and you do that. God says, listen, I will lead you beside these peaceful streams. And, and, and what happens is your life isn't fully satisfied. Because I don't believe it can be unless you drink the cup of Jesus. I know it sounds so crazy. Because that's, that's what he says in John 7 37. He says this. He says, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. You know, if you think about that verse, it sounds so crazy. If somebody, if you're not a Christian here, Come on, I'll explain that, because it does sound really weird, right? So think about this, but Jesus was saying this. He says, listen, if you're thirsty, come find because I'm full of living water. He was basically using this allegory, this, this metaphor, to say, listen, I am everything, and when you taste a little drink of me, your thirst is going to be fully satisfied, and you'll never go thirsty again. My grandfather used to make this drink. We call it Kool-Aid. Anybody know what Kool-Aid is? Well, it's like this, it's kind of like the Luda drink, but it comes in a packet, so it's just like crystals, right? So it's these red crystals, and you would put it in with water, but it tastes terrible unless you literally take about four cups of sugar, and then you put it in there. And, and I remember as a young little kid, like, we would go to my grandparents' house, and they would have a, a nice pitcher of Kool-Aid in the refrigerator waiting for us. But we, we would always ask, who made it, Grandma? Or grandma, because grandma was a little bit more smart how much sugar she put in, but grandpa didn't care. He wanted his grandkids to be fully satisfied. So as little kids, we would walk in and we would say, hey, who made it? And if grandpa made it, we would look at each other and say, this is the good stuff. We knew what was happening. Here. And this is what Jesus was saying. He was saying, listen, he wasn't saying drink the Kool-Aid. He was saying, listen, when you take a sip of me, when you allow me to satisfy the thirst, you will never go thirsty again. Our bodies need water, and our spirits, just as much as we need water, we need Jesus Christ to satisfy this thirst inside of us. But here's the problem. Just like we try to satisfy our hunger with so many things, but we get, we get hungry again if they're not Jesus, we will get thirsty again if we try to satisfy our thirst with everything else except Jesus Christ. See, we try to satisfy this thirst with relationships. But unless you're in a committed married relationship, those relationships are going to break apart, they're going to hurt you, and it's just not, sometimes that's just not the best place. But if you put everything into that relationship, and you expect those relationships to satisfy that need, what's going to happen? You're going to get thirsty again. And so you see this, and I've seen it over and over again, is that people who even love God will jump into an in and out of relationship, because what they're trying to do is satisfy this thirst. But it's not going to happen in the See, we look for education, and, and, and education is good, but you know what? If you look to satisfy your thirst in education, there's going to come a point in your life where you can't get any smarter. You can always learn something, but there's going to come a point in your life where you ask yourself, I've got seven doctors, and, and, and I'm this smart, but you know what? There's something still inside me that's missing. Unless it's Jesus, you're going to get thirsty. Some of us look to our bank accounts and to our finances. Some of us have these awesome dreams that we're trying to accomplish. And we put everything into these ideas and dreams, even sometimes these God-given dreams. Yet it's not Jesus who satisfies us. We're going to get thirsty again. So people come to church and we're frustrated because we don't know what's wrong and we don't know what's missing because we believe in God and He's there, but yet. We haven't really fully understood what it means to allow him to satisfy that person. When we go hungry, and eventually what's going to happen, you're going to give up on God, you're going to get frustrated. Church, you don't come to church that much anymore. If you expect me to, to, to feed your thirst every week or our special guest speakers, you've got a lot to learn because it can't happen from us. If you come in and you only worship one time a week here at church, 
you know what, you can get thirsty again because you're sad, your, your, your need for God has happened throughout the week. It's so much more than that. It's saying, Lord, we want to come to you. The Bible says in Jeremiah 2.13, he says this, he says, My people have done two evil things. They have abandoned me, the fountain of living water. And then he says this, They have dug for themselves cracked cisterns that can hold no water. And if we stop trying to abandon God and stop trying to build things that can satisfy that thirst, He'll satisfy us again. And you know what's amazing? I've seen it time and time again that we will never go thirst again. We'll never go thirst again. Two more. Psalms 23, 3 says this. These are the benefits of what happens when we belong to, the, to God's God. Is that He renews, he renews me. The Bible says, Psalm 23 says, He renews my strength. You might be asking, well, why in the world do we have a picture of an upside down sheep there? Well, this is so interesting. You might not have known this, but there's a verse in Psalm 42 11 where David's talking and he asks, I gotta ask himself, he says, Why are you so cast down, O oh, my soul? And he kind of goes on. And see, cast down was this old English term that what it literally means, it means to be put on your back. And see, and this is what's so dangerous, is that if a sheep's put on their back for it's, it's not, not even a very long time, that they will die that way. And it happens so often, and I was, as I'm reading this book by Philip Keller, he's talking about how a good shepherd, like almost every morning, has to go out there and he has to find a sheep that, that are in trouble, he's got to flip them over, which is no easy task. He says, because if he leaves them there, they'll die. What happens is the birds, the birds, the vultures began, begin to circle around because they know oh, there's a sheep and it's just going to be a matter of time before this carcass comes up and they begin to sometimes even pick the sheep alive, you know, while they're still there because they're helpless. And if you think about people, and I don't know what's happening in your life today, but maybe this is literally how you feel. You feel like you're just downcast, you just feel like you're on your back. And and, you're, and, and, and in that position, you're just helpless. See, even as a Christian, and I think somebody, many of you will know this, and you'll say this to, to yourself and to other people, that we never claim to be perfect. We don't. When you put your faith in Jesus, we never claim to be perfect. We never claim that we're going to live a perfect life. But this is what we do know. That we know that when we are hit with some of life's hardest times, that we know that we have a good shepherd that is there to bring us, put us back on our feet, and help us live again. And maybe you're here today, and this is you. You feel like, like you are a Christian, but you just feel beat up. You just feel like life's pelting everything out of you, and, and you're just confused, you're scared, you're worried, you're panicked, and, and this is how you feel. You feel hopeless. You feel like everything's being thrown at you. And today, you just want to ask God, you say, God, give me here to my strength. Lord, can you just pick me up on it again? You know, it's amazing when they get picked up on it again. It's almost like they come back to life. There's something inside of them that says, that's all I need. And maybe today, you just need that jolt from God. And you might be in a great place today. That's amazing. And, and right now in your life, just ideas are flowing, creativity just seeping out of you. And, and just, there's just great positive energy. But I want you to hold on to this. That in those moments of life, where you feel like you're cast down and on your back. Know that there's a good shepherd and a God who loves you, who cares about you, and no matter how many times you fall on your back, he will be there to read with you. And for me, that, I take so much great comfort in that. That God never gives up on us. He never gives up on walking out into the great pasture. You guys say, God, I'm so sorry. He says, that's all right. Let me help you back up one more time. Someone was a shepherd, this was their livelihood. So could you imagine if the same sheep over and over again fell on his back and they said, you know what, forget that sheep. I'm out here every morning picking this guy on his back. He should learn his lesson. He would lose his livelihood, whether it's going to be giving new birth, big plans, one shots, whatever. Something's going to happen, right? If he loses his sheep, but a good shepherd cares about his sheep. And God Almighty cares so much more. Uh, so God renews us. And this is what it says in Isaiah 40, 31. It says, But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. So our good shepherd renews us. And finally, just quickly, 
Psalm 23 3 is that he guides me along the right paths. The Bible says in Psalm 23 3 that he guides me along the right paths. I was watching this cartoon model this week with uh, it's called Betty Tales. It's like these vegetables who um, teach kids good lessons and they're pretty good. You know, I kind of uh, uh, just sit there and get a little annoyed at their voices, but at least my, my daughter's learning like these good value lessons. And, and this week it was so cool because I was trying to teach her, you know, you, have, you try to teach a little girl about the Holy Spirit, about the conscious how the Spirit speaks to us, and, 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 um, and, and I try to do it in like a way that she can understand, but maybe I was feeling like that, right? So then this cartoon comes up, and here's this little vegetable who is working in a shop, and, and the, the shop owner says, listen, whatever you do, don't turn the heat up. Because we need the shop to be just at the right temperature. And the girl's working and she's the most high girl's vegetable. And she's working hard and she begins to get real cold and she says, oh, I can just turn it up. And this is what happens, and you've probably seen this in, in even some movies. Then all of a sudden, she's standing right in front of the, the thermometer. And who appears? On one shoulder appears like a good angel of herself. And on the other shoulder appears the, the bad angel of herself. And the whole time, the, the bad angel saying, listen, just turn it up a little. No one will even know. And then the good angel says, you shouldn't do that. And I'll show it to Jesus. Why? Why? This is what our conscience is like. But, but this is like the Holy Spirit speaking to us. And, and, and I smile up at the right time when we need to know what we have to say. We trust God. I didn't say it so eloquently. We trust God. When we hear that voice inside of us, it tells us exactly where to go and exactly what to do. And we don't need to be afraid. Now sometimes that's hard. Because God will try to guide us along the right path. But you know what? There's always that devil on the, on the other shoulder saying, listen, it's, it's okay. You know, and it's so crazy because in this little cartoon, at first it just started, the, the little devil said, just turn it up just a little notch. And, and the girl said, okay, that's fine. And she turned it up just a little notch. And, and then she went back into her life, working in the store. And a few moments later, she said, well, not warm enough. And, and then it slowly kept saying, just turn it up a little bit more. Just turn it up just a little bit more. See, because if we're not careful to allow God to lead us, what's going to happen is you can slowly begin to make compromises away from what God has for us. And you'll find yourself so long, so far from God's right path. That you're going to be blurring the lines. But God will be there to help you leave, but it's going to take a lot more to get you back on that right path. You know it's crazy. I don't want to warn all of us. Be careful about this path along the right path because I think it's, it's changing. The world's already been on a messed up path. But I think this idea of, of this right path is beginning to shift within even church culture. We're starting to come where where the line used to be so black and white, but yet what happens is we're seeing this shift that even in the church world, we're starting to allow certain things to kind of come in, to kind of come in to creep in. And we need to guard that and say, Lord, listen, we want to be Holy Spirit led, and we want to be guided by you and you only, Lord. And the Holy Spirit is here to convict and to help us. And He's not just there to take away our fun. But he's trying to help us to stay on the right, right path because he knows what lies ahead. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want to do. He takes me like that in green pastures, he leads me beside the still water, he renews my soul, he guides me along the right paths. So when we put our faith in Jesus and belong to his flock, there's so many benefits, and it makes our life so much easier if we allow him to lead us. Can you say lead me? Lead me. Lead me. And I'm going to finish with this story. There's a mother of a, of a young boy who was real sick. He just had just a few weeks to live. He didn't have very long. He was sitting in this hospital bed and he was just in a lot of pain. And he didn't know what to do and the mom was trying to think of the best thing. The boy was seven years old. And she taught him something. She said, listen, I, I want you to grab your hand. And she said, I want you to just take the first few, few words of, of Psalm 23 and just recite it over and over and over again. So she would say, so for every word, it would be one thing. So the Lord is my shepherd. So she would have him do that. She would wake up and she would see him and she would cry out. She would say, Mama, 
distant, you could cry out to say, Mom, it's so much in pain. She would say, Honey, hold up your hand. She would together with her, she would say, So this is what she taught him. Every time she held up her hand, every time he held up his hand, yeah, the Lord is mine. Every time she got to the ring finger, she said, Son, I want you to take your other hand. I want you to grip it tightly with your other, with your other hand. And I want you to know, just like you're gripping your hands, how much God cares about you. She would, she, he would do that over and over again. And each of my, she would watch him. She would peek into his room. And every time he was in pain, he would be crying. He would say, and he knew it was in his heart. So finally, when he came the morning that he passed away, he went into the room just to see him. She knew he wasn't breathing. And when she had turned, he went to the other side of the bed to see his face. There was a little boy who was holding up. It was sort of pain. And obviously, the mom was real sad that she lost his son, but this is what she that her son died surrounded by the good of Jesus Christ. I want us this year to know as a church that we just don't serve God. But God who doesn't care. We serve God who's personal. We serve God who's real. We serve a God that we can say is mine. And when you're downcast this year, I want you to do that. I want you to take your hand and say, I want you to know that in that moment, he's thinking about you and his whole world is stopping his focus on you and what you're doing. And every time this year when you feel like you're full of tension and you're hungry for more and you don't feel like you're being satisfied by anybody else, I want you to say, the love Lord is We've got big decisions to make. When we repeat those words, the Lord is 